This panel is why do we need European space? So it implies that it exists and we need to find the reasons why we need it. But the very fact that it is there, it, it, it's, it's a given. There are different viewpoints on this. As early as yesterday and today, we heard it also said by somebody, this dichotomy, if you will. There is European bureaucracy, yes. Is that, is that the European space we need? There are European states, nationalism, patriotism. Finally, there is, there are activists in Europe. There is society, there is civil society that is beginning to build in parallel its own institutions and communications in many ways that go contrary to the institutions of the European order we are supposed to discuss, saying that this is our instrument of our for our own common good, which was the case yesterday when we discussed climate and we were saying how cities start communicating with one another going beyond and contrary to what the states do when they don't recognize climate change and about global warming. There are many other examples. So the questions that we will raise today, it will be something looming over us. So this European space, is it there or is it not? I suppose everyone on this panel would say yes, but they will have to somehow give us their arguments and explain to us why they think it is. it exists. Well, I suppose you know all the our experts on this panel, but just in case I'd like to mention Mikhail Minakov, probably you we will call you political scientist, uh, the very word university. You now work for Basel University and the Canon Institute from Ukraine. Nil Liker from the uh, um, research professor, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Mikhail Solman. Yes, most importantly, I sit on the board of the school, that is most important. Yes, please, listen carefully. I wouldn't, don't need to introduce Bobolo because he moderated this panel. I don't want to this time. Mitis Yurgonis has been many times taking part in this conversation, so he is an activist and political scientist. Mikhail, can I give you the floor first, especially, I know that you have some slides and some pictures you've drafted for this presentation. Well, thank you. Indeed, when they set me, uh, gave me an objective saying that I need to speak at this panel, of course the most important thing is about values. Which values, what values are the guiding principle when we speak about Europe and the EU? And I've been showing you the picture that many of you who listen to my presentations at different fora have seen before. This is the so-called Review World Values Survey. On to, so to say, areas, if you will, vertical, or Y axis, they are traditional values, and uh, the further up, the more rational and less traditional. And X axis has the most how shall I put it? Just survival, survival values, collective decisions taken for general survival, and they lean towards independence, ind independent thinking of an individual rather than a community. They're not community driven. So I suppose whatever is further up it means greater trust, greater confidence, and greater trust for common institutions. And the EU can be placed on this graph. It can be first divided into many components, as you can see, Protestant Europe, English-speaking Europe, Catholic Europe, you name it, and then the rest of the world. So, more or less, 
I would put it this way. When, as we move towards northeast in this graph, we get closer and closer to values of enlightenment. They are values. We had a, there's a great discussion going on about the academia, uh, what is the relation between values and institutions. But it would be good to take a look at the outcome of these values as they are implemented, or as the English, uh, what the English call the proof of the pudding. This graph, um, this spreadsheet, I'm sorry, is very busy, but this is rating, country rating on HIDI, Human Development Index. Those who have heard to my presentation, um, I will have to repeat my slides. This is a measuring device, a measure that seeks to reflect GDP per capita, of course, and all other matters, but also the uh, what people can do. And this includes healthcare and education as the main indicators. And countries may will be distributed about these indicators. And if you look at at the first fifteen countries are more or less Protestant small countries. And what characterizes them for their development? We may say that uh, there are all sorts of varieties, but it mostly applies to Nordic countries. This is the combination of this is about three churches that were founded to oppose the official church. The official church was state church, and it, for many years, since the 16th century has been playing the role that the Russian Orthodox Church is now playing in Russia. That was the mouthpiece of the government. But free and liberal churches, very often their aspirations went hand in hand with the growing force of the worker movement, trade unions and social democracy. In Scandinavian countries, the 20th century is more or less an epoch of social democracy in whatever form it might be. Their program was liberal in terms of religious freedoms and organization, free um, trade unions, freedom of expression, and so on. This is what about proof of the pudding. These values that go hand in hand with the political institutions, but most importantly, we're speaking about democratization of these countries. This is something that promoted their positive development. One can say that these values not only are they good per se, in a sense, they are philosophical and humane, nice values, but we might cynically add to this is that they uh, make profit, sort of. They give concrete outcomes in development of society. A totally different matter is this index of trust for public institutions. Now it is very fashionable, it's a buzzword, and research is being done about the role of trust and they are identifying this sort of triangle which may be positive or reversed towards negative. Firstly, corruption, inequality, and trust. The more corruption, the more inequality, the, and then less trust. Well, I never give you any spreadsheet or table here, but you wouldn't be surprised that they are first usual suspects countries. They are the ones that rank highest in what has to do with trust. 
I wanted to point out the most important point I wish to make is I would like to oppose, or rather, I would like to defeat, I would rather try to uh, go against this feeling of defeated feeling about the EU. This is a classical question. Is this glass half full or half empty? The important role here is depends on your perspective, on your expectations. I would rather say, in terms of collective Brussels, which is has this idea of continuous promotion and movement towards a federal state, the European state ever closer union. Well, I say their glass is pretty much empty. Their thinking was very original. They had this metaphor that one has to, on an ongoing basis, move forward, ride a bicycle. If you don't, you know, if the bicycle will fall unless you, unless you move, unless you, but this metaphor can be used by those only who can, have never used a bicycle. You can always stop, put your feet on the ground and give it a thought, where am I going? Where am I? But one should give it a thought and it should look at realities. Uh, Truden Becker said that, please look at the EU and please look at other alternatives. What is there for you in terms of alternatives you could adopt? This is where most important role is played by four freedoms. They are this internal or domestic market, which creates the largest trade organization or the um, all the economies put together in the international trade. And this is where we can say that EU has not fully used up this economic capacity to the full. But now we have to oppose to Trumpism. But this may be said about China too. Only now do they begin to be paying attention to China's ascent. Sometimes we may see absurdities there. Uh, during this crisis in Greece, they made the Greeks sell their Piraeus port, just made them privatize it. Who was the buyer? Chinese, the Chinese. And this is why they now have get this strong position to promote the largest project and this about the roads and Silk Road and, and all these bridges and whatever. We must also um, make sure EU plays greater role in the most important question today, that is environment, global warming, and so on. Who was it that promoted uh, the adoption of the Paris Agreements of 2015? Yes, there are many shortcomings about this, but no other force rather than the EU. And now norms are... Uh, who sets the standards in healthcare, in pharmacology? This plays a most important role for the world at large. There are great, uh, greatest potential uh, that has not fully been used about tax avoidance, especially about largest American companies that were mentioned before, as well as about anti-monopoly policy, because one factor that may explain this ever-growing inequality in the world, or rather tax evasion, sorry, this is because of capitals and income that is gained by monopolies. They are the ones who have, you know, have intellectual property. You know, we carry them in our pockets, you know what I'm referring to, because they get royalty from patents. So, most important role, and this is the strength of the EU. We shouldn't disregard it when we discuss 
Oh, should reform said might go this way or the other way. Certainly we have problems here. Firstly, the Constitution. It's known as the agreement or the treaty because the French and the Dutch rejected the idea to vote for the Constitution of the EU. Constitutions are usually very brief. It's a short text that just sets the rules of the game. And this is where they had 360 pages long. I suppose they put it all into a draft constitution. So this is the point of this policy is opening up possibilities just to raise these questions in Brussels. And this means we need to reset the system at, as a whole. So what questions have to be discussed by Brussels, what questions have to be addressed by national governments, and uh, we've been saying that we need subsidiarity. But uh, in reality, the process was underway when we saw rising different questions that were raised by Brussels, where it's not quite clear why it is Brussels that is raising them. This leads to, for example, Swedish Riksdag takes a formal, passes a formal decision just on the decisions made in Brussels, and this certainly undermines or at least disrupts the life of democracy in our countries. And this is why we can't, we can't disregard this main leap forward. Leap forward is that adoption of euro as a general currency. So it was clear that was uh, the mood that is known in Russian. This is a direct quotation from Stalin. It is when people get dizzy because of great success. So they started to adopt policies, but without first creating democratic structures that would promote these policies and without have a financial basis for it. So they thought, well, we will adopt that, we will pass that, and then it would be necessary to adopt the common budget. But this is where they faced a fundamental democratic principles um, that were not agreed by the countries. Another proof of the pudding, where you, where, which is the eating, it had to do with ever-growing economic growth and convergence of economies. Instead, we saw falling growth rates, and which means greater unemployment and all other consequences, and greater, ever greater gap between, say, Germany and uh, France, and Italy, it's growing even further. This graph shows, as the financial downturn uh, in 2008, since 2015, this, in blue you see the rest of the world, then the United States that also experienced financial crisis, and then this Eurozone and Sweden. Sweden is not part of the Eurozone. Sweden uh, enjoyed much better development. Well, this is a general depiction of the Eurozone and the EU countries that are not part of the Eurozone because they continue to use their free monetary policy and they could somehow oppose or counteract this global shock that fell upon the global economy. And the irony of, if you will, is that that Chancellor Kohl that opposed uh, the huge resistance mounted by the experts, he made Germany adopt this single currency with other countries, and he was guided by this, exactly as Mr. Buck. Uh, one of our speakers was saying to build Germany firmly into the European structure so that this monster 
which he suspected does sit in this basement when he referred to extremism so that there is no room. But the twist of the fate is that, or irony of circumstances, we did what gave rise to this AFD, to this extremism. This started with resisting adoption of Euro in Germany. And in France, for them too, that Europe should unite based upon um, monetary policy, it was just like financial Moginot line, which thought no, to them, which they thought was not necessary and was not sufficient. <coughs> and on top of that, which is the difference between these two groups of countries within this is an ongoing the friction between most and foremost between France and Germany. And the Germans say, yes, we're ready to pay for them, but it cannot go on endlessly. And the French are putting the pressure on the Germans so that they should help bail them out, as well as southern countries within the EU. But that is an experiment. This Eurozone is an experiment. It's interesting that the academic understanding is that there is this control group. This is they give top development, better development without political friction. And uh, there is no system of identifying who's risk of deciding who's risk to be held accountable for this, who's responsible for this. Because the way they tr um, tried to address this problem during the Euro crisis, but nobody was held accountable for that. Nobody was made liable for this. And interesting studies, Morelli in the Institute of Milan, that warned which factors might explain the growth of populism. They are this is adoption of all sorts of industrial projects from older EU to the newer EU, if you will. This is a one factor. And the second factor is inability of the political figures to protect their public, their voters, from the aftermath of the Euro crisis. So the countries that are not part of the Eurozone, they somehow fared better in this crisis. So what are the conclusions out of all this? The EU is very important, continues to be very important, and these defeatist movements, oh, sorry, moods, uh, there's no place for them. We must look at reality and we must face them and we must fight them. As to the Eurozone, I'm afraid it will last very long, very much like it lasted long when they tried to treat all sorts of diseases by bloodletting, remember? Or like uh, there are statistical examples where back in 1605, the British fleet sent only two ships to the Far East. <coughs> One of these ships, they had to make uh, the crew eat lemons, and the other crew didn't have, we never made to eat any lemons. But when they reached the Far East, everyone was alive and feeling very well, where they consumed lemons, and the other crew lost half of its manpower. Um. And then, of course, 150 years uh, later, the um, Admiralty finally took a decision uh, to this effect about the need to supply vitamin C um, to uh, um, the crews. Uh, subsidiarity test. The Dutch um, have uh, suggested a simple principle um, if possible, on, on the national level, if need be, on the EU level, uh, insofar as the subsidiarity principle is concerned. Um, in the same um, vein, uh, there is an, an 
need for further soft integration, um, which uh, presumes uh, that uh, there doesn't have to be um, uh, parading integration, but uh, rather encompassing uh, member states uh, into various, uh, in various degrees. As to the geopolitics are concerned, the idea is to introduce a majority-based voting uh, for security matters and uh, defense. Uh, this is a, a path which is uh, very unlikely, and um, it is more expected to have a coalition of, um, of uh, those who desire. Uh, to have this integration, and uh, if we rule out Italy, then the four um, member states, which uh, if we add up the defense budgets, uh, then these are about three times uh, higher than, than the uh, Russian um, military budget, uh, with, of course, a great uh, um, uh, important uh, uh, with the important and conspicuous difference that the Russia has about 5,000 nuclear warheads, and England uh, and uh, and France uh, uh, have a hundred each. Uh, if I may uh, just clarify one point, uh, the there is some skepticism with respect to the eurozone. You have also demonstrated it. Do you believe that uh, Chancellor Kohl was right um, and that? Uh, that the introduction of the Eurozone allowed or helped uh, to quench down um, and indeed uh, to, to uh, uh, somehow deflate the extremist tendencies, including, uh, including Germany. Well, um, as much as I know, Le Pen is basing, uh, and in Italy um, there, is, there are some dramatic figures. If you look at, uh, at the revenue increase, If you look at the euro introduction up until 2018, their revenues have gone by about 30 percent. The same, the same uh, in in French. Uh, um, in Italy, it's zero, um, zero point uh, zero point eight. Um, think of the difference: 13 percent in Germany, 25 in France, zero point eight percent of growth uh, in Italy. So this in, in, uh, inability of the system to, to um, provide for prosperity is, of course, a source of great uh, um, dissent uh, and, uh, indeed, uh, discontent. Um, Greece and Iceland uh, were in more or less commensurate uh, conditions. Um, Draghi was praised here. Uh, for saving Greece, but let me just remind ourselves that Greece l lost um, about 25 percent of the GDP. Uh, Greece was mandated um, to implement uh, the austerity measures um, in budgetary policies, and now Greece rose uh, by several percent. S um, but starting from 2007, uh, Greece is still at uh, minus 20 percent. Mm. Uh, Iceland was not a part of Eurozone. Iceland uh, could write off all of the debts uh, to those uh, we, um, to those who credited uh, Iceland, primarily banks. Uh, so they they hit those um, and. Um, so the operation with with Greece was uh, not so much about saving Greece, but uh, in my view, more of uh, um, saving the French and the German banks and the shareholders of these banks. Well, in the Iceland, the economy uh, went back on track and became uh, more competitive, and they they I think jailed one bank I think which is the only case in the Western world, as far as I know, um, uh, which. Uh, uh, which was jailed. And I think they're now 10 percent better in terms of their economic status compared to 2007. 
If I may <coughs> continue, um, the question is the same. Why do we need a common European space and what is that? Uh, microphone, please. So much for, for the invitation to speak at this conference. Um, I have really enjoyed uh, the, the two days, uh, a lot of interesting uh, presentations and, and discussion. Uh, when I got the invitation to, to speak at this panel, uh, I struggled a little bit with the title um, because it was not intuitively clear to me what does a global European space really mean. I was not really familiar with the term or the, or the kind of concept. But as I uh, interpreted this, especially because kind of the background of this, uh, the school and Council of Europe, um, I, I saw it as a, a space of European universal values of freedom and solidarity. So this is my starting point. And it is clear that there is a need um, to make sure that these values are protected and, and do not fade into the background in an in international context that is, is increasingly dominated by hostility and, and uncertainty. Because, unfortunately, it is true that we live in a period where liberal values are under serious threat, not only from the outside, but also from within the West itself. Um, in the US with Trump, of course, but also in Europe and within some key uh, member states of the EU. Uh, a common way of describing the world we live in um, is a world of new dividing lines. Uh, it, it is frequently being argued that it is no longer about east versus west nor north versus south. It is increasingly um, a dividing line between globalists and nationalists, or those who still believe in universalism and want to promote or protect liberal values, individual rights and international law and multilateralism, and those who believe that world politics is characterized by more of a survival of the fittest, zero-sum game, and na that nationalism and protectionism is the answer. As the values we are referring to have its origin in Europe, and is at the very basis of the EU and European integration process, I would like also to focus on the EU and the role it is playing in the current international context. Uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm from Norway, outside the European Union, but uh, as you all know, we are fairly integrated into the EU and, and a supporter of the whole idea without being kind of a member. So that is a different story. And it's interesting to see here in the previous panel and in this panel, we have this kind of Scandinavian, uh, very kind of supportive <laughs> approach uh, on, on the European Union. And I will kind of follow up on this pep talk that we had, have had uh, until, or both from, from the previous panel and, and also from you. Um, yeah, so, what, so while not all European countries are member, of course, of the EU, um, uh, the EU, I will argue, is, has a really crucial role to play. Not only because it is built on these values and still guided by them, but rather because it is the only institution that has a certain degree of activeness and that has the potential of playing the role as, a, as the guardian of, of these values in the global, uh, global stage. But the difference between the EU and, let's say, Council of Europe is also that it acts on behalf of its member states and its citizens. And this means that it has to balance between promoting liberal norms and protecting European interests. And sometimes difficult choices have to be made in order to protect European citizens, the European way of life, as we have said, for instance, with regards to migration. My argument is that even though the EU seemed to have modified some of its kind of normative power characteristics, both in its discourse and policies, in response to, to a world characterized by more uncertainty, the underlying ambition of the EU is still, I will maintain, the one of universalism. Meaning that it aims at restoring the status of universalism understood as multilateralism, international cooperation, dialogue, and respect for individual liberties and liberal values. Still, it is legitimate to ask what kind of role the EU will play in a new uh, global context where liberal norms are increasingly threatened. Will it be a, be a global player or a playground for other global powers? And will the EU also increasingly 
be focused on protecting its own core values rather than promoting and exporting them to others. For the EU to be a global pl player, I think it is key that the EU plays to its strengths. But what are these strengths? It is clearly not its military power. But we have also seen that the EU has lost some of its credibility as an effective exporter of its basic values. It is interesting to compare the introduction uh, in the 2003 and the 2016 security strategies, the European security strategy from, from 2003 and the global strategy that was, that was presented in 2016. Uh, in 2003, the idea was, and I quote, Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. Europe should be ready to share its responsibility for global security and in building a better world. And in 2016, the wording are, are completely different. I quote again, the purpose, even existence of our union is being questioned. The crisis within and beyond our borders are affecting directly our citizens' lives in challenging situations times, a strong union is one that thinks strategically, shares the vision, and acts together. And this is quite a leap. In 2003, the EU saw a world of prosperity and peace. Now it sees itself as being threatened at its core. And this again spills over to the ambitions and strategy towards the rest of the world, from being an exporter to becoming a more concerned and cautious actor. While the EU of 2003 was referred to as a normative power, the EU of 2016, or today, is presenting itself as a principled pragmatism, principled pragmatist. But what does this principled pragmatism that is referred to in the global strategy really mean? And this is what I'm going to, 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 to try to explain to you um, in the rest of the talk. As I understand it, it means that the EU has to first protect the survival of the EU from external and internal threats, but that the long-term objective is still to contribute to multilateralism and universalism regionally and globally. What this means in practice is that the EU will increasingly find itself in value conflicts. For instance, it instance, it might sometimes be legitimate to sacrifice some normative standards for immediate security concerns. We have already seen this in the South with regards to migration flows. The EU is closing its eyes to human rights, cautious about criticizing Turkey, uh, negative effects of border control on third countries and transit countries, as well as on refugees. And in the East, with regard to Russia, we see it in Ukraine, neighborhood policy that has been revised, or in, in the unions kind of refraining from criticizing China, Turkey, or Russia on key issues. On some sense, this is a version of, the, of a classic liberal dilemma. How can open societies take measures to protect its open society? But I think such short-term and contingent measures does not really lead to an aban total abandonment of, of the long, kind of key long-term objectives, but still is to protect and promote universalism and liberal values. This is still at the core of global Europe, but I think also that the approach uh, has changed. In fact, it seems that um, the EU has been more eager than before to defend some of these principles internally also. For instance, in relation to Poland and, and um, the issue of independent courts and Hungary regarding issues related to protection of free speech and free media, even though it remains cautious. Another point is that the EU is also reconsidering its toolbox. The key instrument is no longer this technical or technocrat mechanism of Europeanization and socialization through enlargement and association agreement which was the main instrument until recently, but rather the use of different forms of power. And it is its various forms of civilian power and regu regulatory power that I think uh, are the most important. As a famous EU scholar, Andrew Moraszek would say, the EU or Europe as such is the quiet superpower the world needs today. 
So what are the European power instruments that can be used to promote and protect universalism and liberal world order? Various foreign policy instruments, the first is the various foreign policy instrument that aims at supporting civil society, democracy building, development, security sector reform, etc. that the EU, EU does. In addition, one should not underestimate underestimate the tool of dialogue and diplomacy, sometimes supporting not so visible track two processes that, uh, that uh, the EU is kind of supporting around the world, and especially in its neighbors, neighborhood areas. But also a very strong instrument that is less focused on is the union's internal market mechanisms. For, for instance, when it comes to screening of international investments, or exporting standards that has been referred to here earlier. Environmental standards, social standards, GDPR, digital, energy, etc. And of course the promotion of rule-based international trade, effective multilateralism, holding on to the Iran deal, the Paris agreements, etc. So this is not to say that um, now, this is not easy. I mean, the EU is not a state, but a collection of states and society uh, that might have different views and perspectives, processes that keeps it together and processes that uh, are pulling it apart. But in some sense, these discussions go to the core of the identity of Europe in global affairs. And I think in spite of the turbulence um, and the many potential dangers and threats towards liberal order and norms, both internally and externally, I think that this value base is, is more solid in the EU than we often think. And in today's world where we need strong political leadership ready to be the guardian of this liberal order, I think that this can only be found in the EU, even though the EU, as all global actors, have to balance between concerns of interest, security and promotion of universalism. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. There's, of course, a question about strong leadership and where do, does the strong leadership uh, has to come from? And, of course, uh, the question is, is becoming uh, ever more urgent. Uh, Mikhail Minakov, if I may uh, ask you to uh, make an intervention. Uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, 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 the lunch and, of course, uh, the discussion um, may uh, be a little bit uh, of a soporific effect. However, let us uh, try to uh, brighten up. Uh, when we talk about political imagination, I do not mean fantasizing. Vico and then uh, uh, Kant uh, spoke about uh, uh, creative or productive imagination. Political imagination tells us what is possible and what is uh, impossible, what is realistic and what is utopian, what is just and unjust. Uh, and the most important uh, um, member uh, or indeed a source of political imagination for the past several hundreds of years has been and continues to be Europe. What does this mean? Well, first of all, it starts with a nightmare uh, for the entire world. In the 19th century, the global Europe was, a, was indeed a nightmare. It was Europe of several cities, St. Petersburg, Paris, London, and then uh, Torino and Rome, and then um, Berlin, uh, indeed uh, r rising uh, um, as an important uh, center. Then uh, these uh, cities uh, uh, extrapolate uh, their uh, paths uh, um, across the planet, and the first genocides. Uh, um, start uh, and are perpetrated uh, in exactly this way, in the imagination of the global center. When I think about this nightmare of the global um, Europe in the 19th century, I remember the words in Griboyedov's diary, uh, who was um, uh, a participant of the colonial war in the Caucasus, and he wrote down his experience after one of the battles when he was coming back from the Chechen village uh, um, that had been uh, that had been uh, um, 
taken and Grybo Yedef writes, uh, uh, we are, the more blood I uh, shed, uh, the more and the better I understand that we are drumming our battles uh, uh, under the flags of the Enlightenment against the barbarian freedom. This unbridled freedom and the civilization that uh, Europe is bringing to the world at the tip of its bayonets. And the global Europe of, uh, of the end of the 20th uh, century and the beginning of the 21st century, indeed Europe united uh, to have no more wars, uh, for armies to become obsolete. Europe uh, mm, which says uh, never again. And this uh, political imagination, which uh, continues uh, to um, to play in places like Chile, the Ukraine, uh, Georgia, France, is still an imagination um, which is still created by white men mostly. And uh, there are more ladies, of course, uh, and there are also, also um, uh, um, more people of color uh, coming into this. However, one of these ideas uh, that has been extrapolated by Europe is a regularity of the state, regularity of the national state. There was a time when uh, uh, all uh, analysis started uh, uh, the, um, when the state uh, is, uh, was emerging from the need of survival, but in the, already in the 20th century, the state was becoming uh, already the source of murder and mass killings in the 20th century, we certainly see that. So the mankind um, invented uh, the state and then the state may start to be devouring its inventor. So um, it is uh, our uh, immediate uh, goal in the past several decades uh, to start and try and stop this Leviathan. Europe of uh, civil society, Europe of principle, um, where the politicians uh, um, are held in uh, check and in a way, the populism is like a revolt of the, some of the political circles uh, against the accountability. So the global Europe of today either goes back to the 19th century and uh, will again turn into a nightmare, or else uh, it will uh, continue uh, in the vein of the founders of the post-war Europe. Because uh, today's Europe, Europe of justice, and solidarity uh, did not only uh, uh, grow up after World War II, but also in the so-called post-war. The worse the war, uh, the, the less just is the peace after it, the less uh, just is the world. So Europe uh, is trying to modify its uh, political imagination. As uh, independent judiciary, as uh, um, uh, as a free economy, is uh, the what Europe is trying to project as its uh, global influence paradigm. And certainly, Europe uh, must become more global and uh, and less uh, national. Um, and indeed, uh, these principles must be um, taken far out of the limits of Eurasia so that in several decades, hopefully, Europe is no longer associated with the notions of colonialism, authoritarianism, or totalitarianism. Thank you. And Africa must also wake up. Well, I hope I woke you up. Oh, thank you and uh, and uh, long live uh, globalized Europe. Well, Vitas, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, do you support um, your uh, colleague? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have to uh, indeed change at least half of what I uh, was going to say because uh, 
I was ready um, to, to challenge uh, almost every word in our panel title. First of all, it's a very Eurocentric, and thank you, Mikhail, that you have Mm, that, uh, that you mentioned it, uh, but uh, um, then the question really is that uh, how much can we doubt? Um, I think that uh, as probably the youngest uh, on this panel, I should say that we need more confidence. That, uh, but when we talk about uh, European heritage, then uh, uh, the heritage of Descartes uh, to uh, put everything uh, under uh, doubt. Uh, we are in uh, uh, Konrad uh, Adenauer Stiftung. And I say to my American colleagues, because when we talk about uh, liberal democracy, uh, it uh, becomes a uh, too narrow uh, discourse because it may not take into account the social democrats and other political um, forces in Europe, like Christian uh, democrats. And uh, um, uh, in Paris uh, last year, there was a panel um, with the uh, participation of some uh, diplomatic academy from Moscow. Mm, and they were saying that uh, there is uh, no more Cold War, uh, there is war between the liberal and illiberal movements. And indeed, we should not be... And uh, rather than... Uh, 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 and what I would like to, to do is to conduct a short uh, poll here. What is implied? Um, uh, in in the notion of the European uh, of the global European space, some would say that these are legal institutions. Some would say that it's freedom of speech. Yet others would say that this is a freedom of assembly, and every person will um, find a modicum of truth. But what I see as a problem is uh, that whenever we uh, talk of Europe, we often talk about. Uh, rights, uh, but very uh, seldom about responsibilities. Uh, we are talking a lot about individualism, but uh, hardly ever uh, talk about the collective values or collective uh, uh, approach. And the either-or um, approach uh, is, I think, not a particularly happy one. It is rather a problem. So, uh, so it's not just about uh, taking, but also giving. There has to be a feedback based uh, on uh, uh, on uh, certain uh, uh, mutual benefit. I can see much of it in, at this brilliant event, but this is not the only place. I'm sure half a kilometer away from here, another discussion is on where everyone speaks about Europe as something like, like an economic prosperity. It's more about its economic success rather than talking about its values. Yes, indeed. And again, despite... Uh, that all those present here, I do hope, would agree that Europe is about values. We must discuss values on the agenda. Most presentations sought to convince everyone, well, things are fine with our economy. And uh, we we'll tried to make this sort of link between values. It is values that give this economic outcomes. And I suppose it's somewhat strange that for 30 years, um, exactly the place that saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, we somehow never learned these main lessons that freedom is one of the fundamental values. And for some reason, we are more prone to discuss demons rather in English. It sounded better. Somehow I started talking Russian apologies. 
Or rather, for those who are not religious, uh, yeah, we discuss problems, we discuss crises. We also speak a lot in Europe about others, or about the other, be they migrants, be they LGBT, but we never discuss us. Honestly, look at yourself in the mirror and say, like Oscar Wilde said, to look and see what we are and what is it. So, to some extent, we are, uh, yes, we are associated and we're lazy. In a sense, what was said about the nightmares, we should shut our eyes on what, on our past, what was bad about it, and we should not also fall into another extreme when we would discuss about pink clouds saying, oh, things will work out fine. We had, yes, we had such things, but now we are fine. So it will be much better if we discuss that what we together can do so that we could improve uh, towards where we had more space and more room for dialogue and discussions. And of course, Europe is not impeccable, of course. It certainly had colonialism in its past, as well as slavery, as well as crusades, as well as witch hunt. And we still have Eurocentric approach. And surely there's inequalities that were mentioned. Well, surely this was not what Adenauer, Manet, and Schumann expected, never expected these outcomes, but they rather had hopes for something else. And instead of keep putting the blame upon ourselves that we never reached equality, maybe it would be best to discuss what is it that we as citizens of Europe, what can we do to make sure that this equality, inequality, we should have see less inequality? And what can we do like individuals as well as as a team? Thank you very much for your attention. Another short manifesto, begin Europe with your, like finding Europe in yourself. Bobo, can I ask you maybe even to be wrapping up or summing up uh, what you have just heard before we look at m much broader conversation with our audience. Mikhail was speaking about the grandeur of what was Europe was conceived to be and about the manifesto and I very much woke up like others but the problems that you referred to the previous two speakers of course they are there and besides don't we really see here some kind of wishful thinking maybe we should yes we should start with ourselves yes let us or some prudence let's remember about great Europe okay let us but so what what next um I'm actually going to pick up something that uh, Mikhail Minakov mentioned about, in a sense, of being uh, less Europe-focused and more global-focused, because I think that is the trend. And um, my own perspective is I'm very much a, a Western liberal. In fact, I live in the most liberal city in Europe, um, in Brighton. But, uh, <laughs> um, but my perspective... I think is much is perhaps more globalist. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, I'm a, I'm an Australian uh, as well as British. Um, ethnically, I'm half Chinese, half French, um, and I spent obviously a lot of my time in Asia and the Asia Pacific. So I'm going to try and come at this problem, emphasising more global space and less European. Um, and really, I want to talk about three themes. The first is what I see as the current situation, the crisis of the liberal order, crisis of liberalism in general. And then I want to address the issue of, well, who or what is to blame for this situation? Now, you know, the classic Russian question, Kto vinovat? And then the third question, which comes immediately after that, is what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to say, oh, no, liberalism's over. The global European space has no chance. You know, the defeatist mentality that we were talking about before. Or are we going to do something about it? So it's the, another classic Russian question. So 
I'm going to try and address these. So let's start off with a crisis of the liberal order and liberalism. I think that the liberal so-called world order and liberalism in general faces its greatest crisis since the end of the Cold War. Liberalism, almost everywhere you look, is in retreat. In the United States, we have a president whose America first rail politique isn't just eroding the idea of a liberal rules-based international order. It is the direct contradiction of that order and its underlying principles. Under his leadership, the United States acts as an old-fashioned 19th century, early 20th century great power. In Europe, we've seen the rise of liberal democracies in Poland and Hungary, as well as the infraction of norms in many other European states. The Western liberal consensus, not just transatlantic consensus, but European consensus is falling apart before our eyes. Regimes that once seemed on the cusp, on the verge of democracy, like Turkey, like Egypt, they are becoming more authoritarian by the day. Authoritarian regimes around the world are not only becoming more numerous, but they are also becoming more repressive. And so this growing tide of authoritarianism isn't just a little divergence from the liberal norm. It is threatening a whole new normal. And this normal is defined above all by naked self-interest and the principle to, to almost uh, to distort Descartes. Descartes said, um, uh, I think, therefore I am. Today's world leaders work on the principle, I can, therefore I will. Now, many of the understandings in post-World War II are uh, security consensus, they're breaking down, such as the inviolability of borders. And indeed, the very notion of a rules-based, liberal or otherwise, but of a rules-based international order has become essentially meaningless. God knows you see it in every strategy document. You know, my own country, Australia, it, a foreign policy a uh, white paper, they talk about the rules-based international order. What the hell does it mean? What are these rules? Who makes them? Who abides by them? Are, are we talking about one order, two orders, three orders? How, how do they work together? So people sort of repeat this mantra, you know, it's like world peace. World peace, liberal rules-based order. These are essentially meaningless terms now. Now, why do we care? Well, the crisis of liberalism isn't just about the crisis of liberal values, but it also jeopardizes the legacy of many of the critical achievements of the last 50 to 70 years. It weakens the capacity of humanity to address some pretty fundamental challenges that are facing us today. So whether it's global climate change, an environmental catastrophe, a renewed arms race, the outbreak of conflict, or uh, the rise of global poverty, if, we, if the, the failure of liberalism means the the weakening of our capacity to address these pretty existential problems. So, if we don't, if the liberal order is falling apart, is there a new authoritarian order? Well, I don't think so either. Um, there's no, people talk about the China model. Look, the Chinese have no idea what the China model is. So how, do, how, how on earth can we know what the China model is? It's ridiculous. You yourselves know that there's no such thing as a Russia model. There's no Turkish model. These countries have very di different ideas and models, if you like, you know, thinking about authoritarian rule. So there is, you know, sometimes you hear people talk about the multipolar order. The multipolar order is just as meaningless in its own way as the term rules-based international order. The, the authoritarian, authoritarian countries have shown no capacity 
to, for system building. They have shown no capacity to develop coherent, cohesive, non-Western norms and institutions. So what you have today is an international environment that is more fluid and unpredictable than it has been in decades. There is a colossal strategic, political, economic, normative vacuum in the world. There is no functioning international rules-based international system of any kind. We, I think, are moving into a post-American era but what does that mean? We don't know what this post-American era is going to uh, look like. We have pretty much a vacuum, a blank slate. So we don't really have a new world order, despite what you know, some people like Sergei Karaganov would have you believe. We have a new world disorder. And this is characterized by lack of clarity about what the rules and institutions of global governance are. It's characterized by the de-universalization of international norms. It's characterized by, I think, the worst crisis of leadership around the world since the 1930s. And we were talking a little bit about the divisions, dividing lines, we are also seeing new ideological divisions. Don't believe people when they say that it's not about ideology. Of course it's about ideology. Ideas matter. These are predispositional influences. Of course we don't have the conflict between communism on the one side and uh, capitalism on the other. Yes, that's over. But instead we have new ideological divisions, new ideological conflicts um, between extremism of... of either far right, far left, and centrism, between internationalism and a kind of introverted protectionism. Ideology is still as relevant today as it's always been, it's just that its forms have changed. So who is to blame for this, this situation that we have? Now, it's very fashionable, particularly in the United States, to blame uh, China and Russia and authoritarian states for ruining what was a perfectly good rules-based international system. Well, there's no doubt that some Russian and Chinese actions have been very negative, not just for Western interests, but for good order. Yes. But talk about a Sino-Russian conspiracy to bring down this perfectly good rules-based international order. Well, that's just nonsense. That's passing the buck. That's evading responsibility. We need to remember first that China and Russia are individual actors. They are separate actors. They have their own interests, priorities, and perspectives. Now, sometimes they agree, but in many cases, as you well know, they don't. And one of the areas where they don't agree is actually on having a liberal, or not a liberal, a world order. The Chinese actually have been the prime beneficiaries of the Western, uh, of the US-led global order and Western-led globalization over the last 30 years. The Kremlin, however, thinks that Russia has been the biggest loser. So that's a completely different perspective and understanding of the problem. So I see the problem, the main problem here. Yes, of course, Chinese and Russian and other actions have been unhelpful, yes. But the real problem of the liberal world order comes from within. And specifically, there are three areas. There's the failure of Western democracies to live up to the principles, to the ideals of a liberal uh, rules-based international order. The second problem is a more mundane problem, which is the failures of Western policy making, whether it's in Iraq or Libya or Syria, and then the third problem, possibly the most serious problem, are the domestic policy failings of Western democracies. Because it used to be the case, you know, you all know the, the comment by Churchill, um, it, it, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Well, the thing is, West, democracy used to have a good reputation, not because it was idealist necessarily, it had a good reputation because it was seen to work better than any other form of governance. It was seen as more effective. Now, the problem today is that we have a, the association, the link between the principles of liberal democracy 
the ideals, and the performance of liberal democracies at home, well, that link between democracy and good governance has been broken. Now, so what Russia and China have done is they've certainly exploited the shortcomings of the West. But it wasn't Russia who got Donald Trump elected in 2016. It wasn't Russia or China who uh, led to, um, who created the Brexit result. These were problems from within. Of course, Russia and China, or especially Russia in those two cases, exploited the situation. But in that sense, they're just acting like a perfectly normal country, frankly. So, what are we going to do about this? Because we can say, oh, geez, we're so bad, you know, we're so weak in the West, liberalism is over. I think there is real scope for a positive liberal vision. But to do that, we need to understand a number of realities. First point, we should stop complaining or whining about the faults of other actors. Yes, of course, much of what they do is unhelpful, but that cannot be the basis of Western policy making. We, you know, a, a, there's a, a China specialist called Evan Feigenbaum, and he said, he came up with a great phrase, whining, i.e. complaining, is not a policy. It makes you feel good, great, but it doesn't actually do anything, does it? Now... The second thing is we should be under no illusions. Even in a perfect scenario, everything going really well, problem solving in international trade, security and environment, this is going to be very, very difficult, going to be an extremely protracted, lengthy process. Third, we need to understand that many of our past assumptions about global order and globalization are anachronistic, are old-fashioned, and no longer relevant. Um, you know, this idea, for example, you know, global European space, that somehow Europe must lead or the West must lead. No, it must not. <laughs> it, must, it must show its quality. But the idea that the West or Europe is born to lead, that is a 19th century concept. Um, excuse me, not even 20th century. So we have to think more creatively and innovatively about the building blocks of a new and emerging international system and order. Fourth, and this is related, we need to accept that US global leadership is over, never coming back. It's not a question of whether Donald Trump or some random Democrat gets in in November 2020. It's not about who wins the 2020 election. It's the fact that the world is moving on. Now, of course, the United States will still be the strongest power for at least a decade, maybe several decades, but the world is changing. And so we are definitely moving into a post-American era. The only question really is, what form will this uh, you know, new system take when it evolves? And I think the only viable, this brings me to my next point, the only viable system in the world is one that's multilateral. Now, God knows, and I mentioned it yesterday in a question or intervention, multilateralism has so many problems. It's, you know, it, it's incredibly frustrating. It seems like nothing ever gets done. It seems to have a million committees but frankly, it's the, it, it may be terrible, it may be inefficient, but it's the only way. And I don't, I don't want anyone to be confused about the difference between multipolar and multilateral. Because multipolar governance is the, of the kind of Yalta 2.0 or Congress of Vienna. That's a nonsense. The great powers are completely incapable of running the world, much as some of them might like to. So the future difficult future is multilateralism. And finally, and this is perhaps the most important, Western decision makers need to address the disconnect between the rhetoric of liberal values on the one hand and the amoral realities, the dismal realities of narrow nationalism and realpolitik on the other. Specifically, that means at the international level, 
that survival of liberalism depends on achieving real progress in addressing fundamental issues like global climate change, uh, poverty, migration, food and water security. Domestically, it means demonstrating, not to others, not to Russians or Chinese or Turks, it means demonstrating to their own populations that liberal democracy is not just virtuous, but also highly effective. And that means confronting xenophobia, social and economic injustice, and the erosion of the rule of law head on. Because ultimately, if we here in this room and in Western circles, Europe, wherever, if we are unable to restore the integrity of liberal norms, values, and institutions, then we cannot expect anybody else, not just to follow them, but even to respect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ну что, давайте, у нас есть еще... We have really 40 minutes to go, so we can afford to talk about that. I wish everyone to get the floor, especially those who never raised their hand before. I will give you priority. Svetlana, I suppose, never raised her hand before. Svetlana Shmilyova, Moscow. I apologize, first of all, to you know, who came up with it, who drafted this agenda, because I must oppose this topic. I must be contrary to this topic, because in the He's a great friend of mine, but if you think of this general Euro or common European space, we must ask a question. First of all, we must ask a question, who are the Europeans? For me, what is different about Europeans is that they used to be open, they researched the world. The Chinese had excellent ships but never went beyond their territorial waters. Europeans some kind of boats, but they are the ones that discovered the world. China could invent different things, large paper, fork, gunpowder, but the Europeans would immediately start using it and would spread it across the world. Nowadays, the situation seems to have changed. Even Ivan Krastev speaks about the monastery. We are saying that it would be good if migrants, and now say that in ancient Rome, was made up. DNA research shows that ancient Rome, by the end of it, was populated mostly by migrants. And China, indeed, and now own sports in Greece and all over the world. And they are the ones who are adopting inventions. They are starting production. They are now they are the ones that are spreading the technology, although they not necessarily invented it. So culture becomes, I don't know to which extent, open, but it starts to spread. Whereas the Europeans are retracting on somehow to limit it because they think the world is complicated. This is my first observation. On the other hand, we are saying that we speak about the global world and we speak about post-war experience here. And at that, it's the fifth year that we meet here. We've never looked, for example, the case of Japan, which for me is incredibly interesting because unlike other countries, the emperor violated um, his uh, silence. Uh, he tried to stop the war before the war. And he said, we must reach peace, whatever price it is, but the military disobeyed him. But he spoke up against uh, violating his vow of silence. And he kept speaking, speaking for peace, which went against their tradition. And his further fate is interesting because he was never condemned. I don't know to discuss the reasons for this, but nevertheless, we see some difference. But at the same time, we surely see the epoch of enlightenment, of peace, some things where we observed, for example, these weddings of the princes in UK, but this happened there back in the 1950s, 60s, when they had the first case of misalliance, of um, the renounced traditions, where the princes um, now married communists, and they thought, it's great to have time with your 
family, with your children, which went against the tradition. I hope everyone knows that the emperor abdicated. It's incredible, whereas Russia adopts a law so that our ruler becomes lifelong ruler. The emperor dedicates three years to amend the law so that he could abdicate the throne because he must give way to the younger generation. And I'd like to point out to this oddity, odd thing. Hence, my question is, about using method of Yuri Petrovich. I tried to substitute this glo common European space. I think about common Asian space, common African space, common even American space. It sounds all very weird, really. And in reality, I suppose, we can either talk about preservation of European culture in the global world, and it makes sense to discuss it, or we are really speaking about civilization. But then it doesn't make sense to call it European. Instead, we discuss the values that are truly universal. This is my observation. Mike, please. I'm Bestrov Andrei, High School of Economics, Center for Republican Studies. My observation is my comment on the discussion, which I think was wonderful. Many polemic statements, I would like to challenge some, I would like to agree with some of them, but instead I suggest we should take a step back to identify the basic principles which can be the foundation for this common space. They are, of course, liberty, freedom, uh, political um, associations, which raise uh, two questions. What are these uh, stakeholders, political stakeholders or agents? Yesterday we referred to Brexit and John Lloyd said that they control back. Well, in Brexit, we see that indeed populists are making use of this logic. When people turn back, they want to be uh, taken into consideration, we become agents of their own fate. We see the opposite trend, at least the way it is misused by these new politicians which are showing up in wearing old-fashioned arms. But Brexit, it's not about Brexit alone. When we speak about those who are uh, stakeholders in this policy. We speak about the sentry appeal forces that we see all over the world. We see Catalonia, Scotland, other examples. The question is who is taking sides with whom? And this is where national states have their expressive nature. These drum sounds can be seen uh, if the Catalans do not want to remain in the same space with the national country with Spain. It's not clear how Spain can forbid them leaving, secede. If we, as liberals, want to profess the principle of liberalism and self-determination and irrespect centrifugal trends, who can become this political stakeholder? So maybe as we try to build the new European space that would avoid the crisis it is facing today, which may be the use of this universal principle of self-determination and freedom of political association, which is the cornerstone of Russian political, uh, of European, sorry, political culture, not just uh, state them in the constitution and then go against them. And those who no longer believe they are part of the national state, they use tanks and riot police and police and force them to remain within to create this marriage that no longer works. We can use this analogy with, uh, for example, with marriage, where husband and wife, if they are reluctant to carry on husband, no matter how fond he might be of his wife, cannot force his wife, even by beating her, to stay in the marriage with him. In, but we can apply it very well to political unions too. Yes, the Ministry of Justice of Russia has recently um, commented on this, uh, saying that, that this may still be the case. Yes, uh, they may still together. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you. It's my first time and very inspiring. It's like a food for the soul, which sometimes we are missing very much in our daily life. So my question uh, is, um, how do you see the role of Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova in the global European space? Because uh, for the moment, uh, those three countries, they are implement implementing EU association agreements. And what might be the expectations, what these countries can offer to the whole 
European space. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello, I'm uh, Aganova from Kazakhstan. I'm, I'm very, very, um, I'm very much in agreement with my colleague uh, uh, Svetlana Shmelov. Mm, indeed, uh, it's, it's about uh, values and not just about uh, economic parameters, which may change. I will have a question to you, Bobo uh, Law. While you said that um, the world is changing, Russia, China uh, have different interests, uh, uh, but when you look at the economic parameters, um, do you believe that Russia and China may arrive at uh, an economic uh, alliance? All right, let's have um, the first round of questions and then we'll get back uh, to, to the audience. And indeed, uh, <coughs> um, there was a, a point. Uh, uh, who will start on? Uh, well, Svetlana, that uh, China is open, I think it's, 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 it's a very, very far, uh, uh, far um, uh, cry from what I really see. I think that China is still a, still a very hermetic country, a hermetic society, mm, and while there is Chinese proliferation, uh, Chinese companies uh, um, uh, everywhere in the world, uh, this is not to say that China is an open society. Uh, in my view. Uh, and finally, Europe is now having uh, a big competitor. I think that Europe has long uh, lived without uh, competition under the ages of America. We are a, live uh, in a post-Pax Americana. Um, I think that uh, Krastev should have said not post-Europe but post-America. We are entering gradually a post-America world and, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe that uh, competition is um, coming back for Europe, and this may well be um, uh, uh, an opportunity for the entire world when we see a rivalry, and, uh, and that being uh, compounded with the environmental agenda, which is uh, uh, more and more uh, saliently becoming a part of the political agenda. So this is the kind of competition which uh, may uh, um, make uh, Europe a lot more effective. Uh, yes, uh, centrifugal forces and uh, nation state. The nation state, state is uh, gradually um, fading uh, out, and I think that any state, after all, is a, is a leviathan, and the, the more successful citizens are to bridle this, uh, uh, this beast, the better. Um, uh, as to Catalonia, I think that it is more of a more of a minority which tries uh, to project itself as a majority. And I think that in Catalonia we see um, that this is the case. Uh, um, on the other hand, when we're seeing such processes, when uh, once uh, um, independent society, uh, what rules in this new world without rules, uh, how could the political systems be uh, construed and uh, built in such a way that they no longer lead to to uh, world wars uh, and uh, this long peace, post-war peace, uh, uh, period of peace is, is now very fragile. Um, and I think that uh, uh, the individual rights, uh, uh, and how is it possible to uh, disjoint the notion of freedom from the notion of the nation state? And finally, it's the, the most important question for, for our part of the world. If you look, I, I just finished my research, and I looked at 30 years of development of uh, 
Southern Caucasus and Eastern Europe. Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And in our part of the world, the winners of socioeconomic development are Belarus and Azerbaijan. We are the losers. Georgians are a little bit less, but Ukrainians are the poorest country of Europe. We won the competition with Moldova in the very bad meaning. And th this is something that we have to, to, to link. Our experience is that democracy should go hand in hand with economic growth, not degrowth. And we are constantly losing this game. Thank you. Um, I will start with the uh, uh, European space, and I, I think that I agree with you, uh, saying that we should not talk about European space, maybe. And maybe that's why, why, why I had so problems with the title of the panel as well. But I still think that, so I, I was thinking about universal values. But universal values, you could argue also that are kind of originated in Europe. At least, I mean, you have universal values, they are universal, but kind of they have been promoted by Europe. Um, and 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 so so in that sense, I think it's right to say to talk about European uh, space that so there are not really right now in the world another kind of uh, actor that can take leadership in these in this kind of protecting of the liberal order. Uh, so that's why I think that it, it's important to, of course, this should not be too Eurocentric, but still it is in Europe that you see most liberal democracies. And, and I think that is important to, to kind of hold on to that and that the EU is actually some kind of guarantee for, 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 for that to continue, even though we see uh, kind of challenges within the union. Um, but I, am, I think that we should not be too uh, pessimistic about what, how, what that kind of... I, I don't think we see a fragmentation of the EU because of Brexit or because of Hungary and Poland. I think that in the end we will see uh, more measures uh, in the EU that will, uh, I mean, the EU is getting tougher with Poland and Hungary, and, and it has to, it has to. The EU has been tough against Brexit, and against the UK, and it has to, because it's a way of kind of get the EU to survive. So I think that, uh, that uh, that's why I wanted to kind of put emphasis on the role of the EU, because in the world today, I think that the EU is the only, because I'm, I don't agree completely with you, Bobolo, that saying that, kind of um, rule of law or, or kind of the rule-based order is meaningless. I don't think so. It depends on how, how you define rule-based uh, system. Exactly. Isn't that the problem? Maybe that's the problem, <laughs> but I think if you, if you connect it to universal values and, and multilateralism, because I, I see it, it was some kind of, of difficult to understand how you started out saying that kind of the liberal order is, is, is threatened, and I agree with you, with you of course, but also that, uh, that kind of a rule-based order is meaningless, but then you end by saying that multilateralism is the answer. And for me, rule-based order is multilateralism. <laughs> And of course, it, it, it has, I think that in the world today, it is, I mean, the EU has to take leadership because it's the only one that really protects liberal order today. Hopefully, in the future, it will yeah, not yeah, be yeah. alone. So I think that that's, um, so I see that um, I don't, maybe I'm not that pessimistic about the situation. I, mean, I think it's, it's under threat, but I think, still think that, that yeah. it's possible to, yeah, so, yeah. Well, I have a few comments. Uh, Svetlana, I would like to object to Svetlana Shmelyov. Uh, when you say that the Europeans are passive, they are uh, self-possessed, um, but when you look at the reality, the EU is the uh, largest uh, unit in the world's trade, which uh, uh, permeates all the, of the economies and indeed plays an even larger role in the world economy than China does. Um, the other thing is that, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, something that is true to say about Moldova, Georgia and the Ukraine, uh, my colleague uh, quoted uh, um, global strategies in 2003 and 2016. Brussels is very good at writing strategies. Uh, these papers uh, 
um, um, that these papers are mostly interesting and important insofar that they are uh, on paper, that this text is laid on paper. And when you look at uh, what has been done, um, uh, I'm sorry uh, that I'm uh, too excited by this question of the Eurozone, uh, but uh, the internal tensions have led uh, to uh, the loss of uh, too much of political capital on trying to respond to this problem. When you look uh, at follow the money, how much uh, money uh, the EU uh, gave uh, uh, to to uh, Georgia, I'm sorry, to Greece and other countries, uh, uh, and how much has it given to to the Ukraine? Um, I think that here the, the EU must have been a lot more active, both in the Ukraine and in in these uh, coterminous. Uh, States, but as I said, a lot of political capital has been uh, um, exhausted. Uh, Chancellor Merkel was at some point interested in Moldova, and I thought, oh well, he is powerful Germany trying to to help Moldova. Well, nothing worked really. Uh, then uh, mm, uh, Russia and China. A question about Russia and China. Mm, I think that it's uh, it's like a dragon with a with a with a with a mouse, I mean, economically speaking, <laughs> China and Russia. Well, uh, the attention to Russia is well understood. It's in the news because of the nuclear weapons, but economically speaking, it's uh, it's uh, minuscule, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, we are seeing. Uh, uh, that Russia's economic uh, influence is almost non-existent. Uh, and finally, the European uh, space, uh, it's certainly not just Europe, but it's the British Commonwealth, um, the United States, uh, Australia. Um, but I, I don't even uh, remember if anything has been said about uh, the part of the world which, uh, demographically speaking, in a matter of decades, uh, will have more people than in China and India together. I'm talking about Africa. And in Africa, um, because of the traditions, uh, by virtue of tradition, there are some possibilities for moving uh, European agenda, not necessarily in a military way. One should not uh, forget about the rhetoric. Uh, uh, interestingly, the U.S. is never mentioned. Uh, the role of the United States is uh, like the role of Trotsky in the October coup. Uh, the uh, the uh, ac actual monumental role of the United States in post-world order is hardly ever mentioned in Brussels. It's still a stronghold of peace. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the Treaty of Rome, I think of uh, the number of colonial wars uh, uh, at the time of the Treaty of Rome. Eight colonial wars were raging, according to Timothy Snyder. So uh, times are changing and people are changing with time. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mm. Yes, indeed, we can talk a lot about international institutions, uh, Mm, leaders, uh, uh, political capital, absence or lack of leaders, and uh, when we talk about Europe one more time and we end up with the Donald Trump, uh, this is becoming uh, um, uh, a stress, a very stressful uh, panel. So, uh, uh, улицу, наше общество, да, ну то есть там что политики мутят и так далее, ну то есть... 
whatever the politicians, international uh, societies uh, do, I think tech, take back the control is the uh, creed, is the motto, is the word. Uh, take back control on the level of community, on the level of, uh, of a society. The 3000 conference in the Czech uh, um, in the Czech Republic, uh, Havel, a legacy has been spoken about for 30 years. Why talk, um, let's have a new Havel, let's uh, a new Havel uh, take up the torch of Václav Havel. Why talk about uh, Havel legacy for 30 years? We need to do something, we need to be active. We need to take back control and we have to look into the mirror. And when we talk about uh, um, uh, talk about the uh, decline of the West. Spengler talked about the, 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 the decline of the West 100 years ago, but Europe is still there. It's uh, up and running, it's uh, safe and sound. Uh, so uh, uh, demons put aside, let us uh, think of, of those great things uh, that we still have, uh, that we still um, uh, uh, um, uh, think of all the things that were taken uh, to the world from Europe. And when I uh, see uh, some Euro enthusiasm in uh, Georgia or the Ukraine, and even more enthusiasm in uh, the uh, Euro with respect to Europe than in France, then this is where I should. Uh, um, uh, myself get uh, uh, inspired. And so when we talk about the Eastern partnership, uh, yet again we talk about geopolitics, not about uh, the norms and the uh, rules uh, and the values. Azerbaijan is good. Azerbaijan is good because it's uh, anti-Kremlin. And there are lobbyists who are saying that Azerbaijan is good because it's a rival of our rival. Um, now, is this uh, a meaningful discussion after all? Uh, I'm going back to values and the fact that we go back to values uh, is exactly uh, what we need. Uh, um, uh, values are after all the basis of prosperity. Thank you. So, um, so many uh, complicated issues. Uh, let me try and address some of the points. Um, the reason I, I, I want to get away a little bit from this idea of a European space and speak more about a global space is, if nothing else, the sheer pace of globalization in the world. Now, in the West, and not just in the West, but in the West, we tend to think of globalization as an essentially economic phenomenon. We also tend to think of globalization as Western-led globalization. And I think both those interpretations are flawed. Globalization is a multidimensional phenomenon. It is political, geopolitical, cultural, normative, um, technological. So we need to think that we are living in very much in a global space. And what, what we also have in the world, we are living through a period of a sort of accelerating pace of history. And this is reflected in an accelerating pace of globalization in so many forms. So we can no longer say, this is Europe, this is Asia, this is Africa. Maybe we can in a sort of a fairly narrow cultural sense, but in terms of sort of thinking about global order, governance, future, even civilization, we need to think beyond our sort of those traditional continental limits. Um, it is, uh, let me uh, go to the second one, which is, you know, this, I, I, I did raise this yesterday with, with John, and, um, you know, this, this take back control. The question I always have uh, is that take back control against whom? In other words, I remember I, I, I was at a wedding and I got into a conversation and someone said, uh, asked me, look, um, how are you going to vote in the Brexit referendum? And I said, well, you know, my wife and I, we're Remainers. And she said, oh, we're not. And I, I said, oh, wh wh why are you going for Brexit? Because bearing in mind this is in Wales, Wales gets a lot of EU funding. So you think, well, why would you, you know, cut this source of fund? Yeah, this is madness. And, and they said... Well, David Cameron, then British Prime Minister, screwed us out of our pensions. 
And I said, oh, okay, oh, all right, but then if he cheated you out of your pensions, why do you want to actually give him more power rather than uh, leave it to Brussels? I don't understand. And, she said, and then her response was, he screwed us out of our pensions. In other words, it wasn't a rational thing. It was a faith. It was something visceral that came deep from within. It's not about your brain you know, being engaged here. Um, now, on liberal principles, uh, creating a new European space based on liberal principles, uh, or even a European area, let's just be sort of not too specific here. The problem is not the liberal principles. The liberal principles are wonderful. The problem is we don't implement those liberal principles. And it's not just, you know, there's oh, you know, occasional breaches of human rights in Poland or Hungary or some other European country. It's the fact that we are bre breaking these principles and these rules and disregarding these norms and values on an everyday systematic, systemic basis. And it's interesting. It's, it's, it's got to the stage where we're not even pretending. I attended the Leonard Mary conference in uh, Tallinn in, in, in spring. And there was a, Hung a Hungarian minister for Europe. And he proudly said, we in H Hungary, we subscribe to democratic principles, but we do not subscribe to liberal principles. He said it flat out. Check, check, it, uh, check, check the YouTube. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. This idea, association of liberal democracy, that was completely severed by the Hungarian minister, not for defence, but for Europe. Now, Russia, China. The thing about Russia, China is this. They are so unequal. So it's like an economic colossus, an economic giant. Listen, now, Russia is still a significant size economy, but it's a much, much smaller economy. China doesn't really depend on Russia. It, Russia it imports more oil than from any other source. But if Russia were to tomorrow to cut off oil exports to China, China would get them from some other source. So Russia is useful to China but China is essential to Russia. And so that creates a very unequal dynamic in the relationship. They also have very different views of the current international system, as I mentioned. Russia, uh, Russia thinks that the international source system has given it nothing good, has basically exploited it, um, reduced it to... Uh, you know, a level, a, it reduced its honour, status, influence. The Chinese actually think that the international system has been pretty good to them. Now they want more influence over that international system, but that doesn't mean they want to break it. That's a very different mentality. The Chinese also tend to see in the world in bipolar plus terms. They see the US-China relationship as the pivot of global governance. Now, of course, other countries, other powers, multilateral institutions, they will play important roles. But let's not kid ourselves. Those roles will be secondary in the Chinese worldview. Whereas Putin, Putin himself, has, the number of times he refers to Yalta as the perfect agreement about how to deal with international problems. Putin thinks in a concert of Europe, Yalta 2.0 kind of way. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but one thing that's for sure is it's so very different from the Chinese way of looking at things, which is the main reason why China and Russia, this relationship works very well for them both. They both have a strong interest in the relation in cooperation continuing, but that doesn't make them a strategic alliance. This is what people misunderstand. Each has their own reasons for pursuing the relationship. It's not you know, because they have shared ideas or shared views of the world. That really is not the case. Now, just a quick comment. Um, you know, look, Mikhail, I, you know, China is... It's obviously not an open, transparent society like we have uh, in, in Western liberal democracies. But I, uh, let me just say, I, I'm, 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 I get nervous when people say the Asians are mysterious or the Asians are not transparent like us Europeans. And those pe people who think that, they, they forget the sort of lessons of history. You know, 
we talk a lot about the Silk Road today, but the, the original Silk Road was the ultimate, the Tang Dynasty in the 7th to 10th centuries was the ultimate globalising power. It, it, it was an incredibly rich, it was the, the site of the original Silk Road and of course, that didn't last. But even early in the 20th century, China was much more open, very, very corrupt, by the way, but a much more open society. Uh, so, and also, even today in China, go to Guangzhou in the south, just the other side of Hong Kong, or go to Beijing, it's like being in completely different countries, completely different mentalities. So be careful that, yeah, we all do it, and I'm as ignorant as anyone, be careful that you just you think it's mysterious. It may be because you just don't know very much about it, you know, and that you need to inform yourself. Look, I say this about myself as well because I'm just as ignorant as. Um, uh, just very quickly, um, yeah, addressing your points, uh, Penilla. Europe is still the leader. I I can't see that. Put it this way: Europeans might think that. No one else does. The Americans certainly don't. Uh, literally no one else does. Um, Australians don't, that's for sure. The uh, Australians think uh, America is still the leader. Now, erosion of rules-based order. The problem is, when we use the term rules-based international order, we use it as a kind of placebo. We use it as a sort of a mantra to say, if we say it often enough, it exists. Whereas what we really have to do it in, in, as liberals and living in liberal democracies, as we have to work much, much harder to make it effective. Because we'd, we've got lazy and complacent. We just say, ah, we Europeans, we believe in transparency, rule of law, accountability, and that's enough. Don't you believe us? You know, so we have to make it... We, we can't just do the talking. We have to walk the walk as well. Now... When I mention multilateralism, it's not that I don't think we can do, we can have a new order, but we, we have to, tr multilateralism is the way of the future. It's not working very well now, but I see it as the only solution. But what we certainly can't do is sit on our hands and say, oh my word, we are virtuous liberals. That will not cut it. And being and, and emphasizing and just saying rules based international order in every, every single Western policy document, that's not going to work either. So we really have to work much harder, be less complacent and less self satisfied. And only then will we make, start to make a little bit of progress, although, as I said, that progress will be very hard work. Dear friends, uh, we've got uh, about five to seven minutes. Uh, uh, I could see one, two, uh, one, two uh, well, remarks to be made. Yes, it's fine. It was on the, on the um, uh, no, 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 no. I, I was, I, at a certain point in time, I started to look at the watch. Uh, uh, значит, uh, я, uh, да, да, Миш, um, у меня вот какой вопрос, на самом деле. I've got a question uh, to ask. Of course, it um, deals with, with uh, what Vitas and Mikhail Solman spoke about. That's a question about uh, the story of the demise of America uh, in terms of global influence or global affairs. I remember um, I'm not uh, that young not to remember the end of the Vietnam War. At that time, the U.S. global influence was also uh, well, um, uh, well, um, um, bid uh, uh, goodbye. However, this uh, has not happened, and certainly America kept uh, uh, its uh, role. And anti Americanism is uh, well uh, um, alive. Although it's not quite clear to me how Europe could do without the United States, including in the military aspect of it. I suppose NATO that we spoke less about is a very important anchor 
in this global West, and there is no way to go without it. And secondly, Bobo spoke very rightly about the moral example, about the importance to behave. This has to do with the United States, too, for that matter. But let's look, for example, at which countries adopted Magnitsky law. Just the United States, Canada, Great Britain, UK, sorry, and three Baltic states. Hello, Latuva. Okay, whenever who says something about values, regrettably from this city, from Paris, from a number of other European countries, somehow never adopt these laws, although seemingly who could object to co fighting corruption or against violations of human rights? So I would very much want these comments to be heard about moral leadership. How can you achieve it practically and the role of America? Well, you have the floor now, please. I'm afraid we... Yes, I'm Yedlini Drogov. I'm from Kirov. Uh, being aware that our time is up, uh, I would like to... Uh, instead of a question, I'll give a comment, short comment. We're saying that without enlightenment, without clear understanding that we have uniform values, uh, universal values, it's impossible to have a dialogue, impossible to improve relations to, within the countries and between the countries. Nevertheless, we see processes that tell us there is a rollback, there is a crisis of dialogue and values. An example given by Bobolo is that two facts uh, are never linked within one's minds. The question is very much what needs to be done, что делать? And I recall the aphorism of the Russian writer Saltykov, Shidrin, a satirist, who actually lived, uh, who was exiled to my hometown. He was saying, his phrase is, I'm quoting, enlightenment has to be done with caution and, if possibly, avoiding bloodshed. So we can see that in those cases where bloodshed is unavoidable, Nothing good comes out of it, let alone if one is passive and doesn't do anything. Uh, enlightenment will not come on its own. This is something that Yuri Petrovich referred to. Who will enlighten the, those who are supposed to enlighten others? This is a rhetorical question. Well, okay, one, one person, well, you and you and this will be the end of it because we'll run out of time. Thank you very much. You know, every time as I listen to, I get convinced that China, nobody knows China. Few people understand that. And this can be seen by a simple integrator, overrated exaggerations uh, about China, whatever it is. We tend to exaggerate. And it seems to me that China uh, threw to us this like a bone. One road, one belt, one road that isn't there are two fine tricks. Why an ancient trick, like referring to the Silk Road? Yes, uh, they, with, in my country, there's little reality standing without it. And the second trick is a common a great fate. And this is the funniest part of it. Because when they say to Russians and Russians nod, we think it's about communism. But when they say it's to us, the nomads, and uh, film, uh, the uh, film uh, like uh, the wall, about the Chinese wall, and we are p p portrayed like dragons there, uh, it's even worse. Few people tend to analyze China, what people think about there. And there are very many people there. And <laughs> And we know that um, we see middle class rising in China. We can see millions of conferences. If some of you visited China, I'm sure more of if you travel to China, it's a huge conferences attended by millions about this. And we're, of course, strongly impressed how much about private property, reality across the world, let alone states, we're speaking about corporations, and that almost nobody, with the exception of specialists, ever reads Chinese books. Uh, films about China are made in Hollywood. Hello, Kung Fu and Panda. And what do we know about China? Chinese food. Overrated exaggerations. I leave where just nearly under, let's say, on the belly of China. I would probably somewhere like its ear. And this is 
Our perspective of China is very, very different, different discourses. Even when we speak about Xinjiang, we speak about concentration camps, tragedy, but first and foremost, it has to do with civil resistance. And Uyghurs are not alone there. Muslims are not alone there. Things are much more sophisticated, and have, it's been long since I've ever heard perform this sort of analysis. Thank you. A very brief comment uh, to Michael about the Eurozone, uh, because I got the impression that the Eurozone was being blamed for a lot of things which were going wrong in a number of uh, European countries. But just take us some examples. Uh, if you take Ireland, even if you take Spain, okay, there's a right-wing party called Vox, which I think has come about essentially because of the Catalonia problem rather than the uh, uh, austerity. And then you look at Portugal, which is a country which uh, uh, has undergone a great deal of austerity. Uh, it uh, has come through that, and there is not a... The, the only party which exists, which stood in the last elections, I think got 1% or perhaps 0.5%. There is no Eurosceptic party there. Uh, they're countries which uh, are more European, pro-European, uh, than uh, many other countries. And uh, I, I think it's got nothing to do with the euro. I mean, it's something which is inherent in countries. And the last thing is, I mean, you talk about the cost of money being spent in order to bail out countries. The whole purpose of the European Union was a question of solidarity. And the rich countries should, in fact, be helping to uh, enrich or to uh, help the poorer countries uh, come to the same uh, degree of uh, uh, living standards as in the other countries of the European Union. Unfortunately, we have to finish this session. I cannot give the floor to all the panelists because we have no time left if one of you is ready to wrap up and uh, there was a question maybe this this will be enough but unfortunately I can't give the floor to everyone Mikhail would you like to wrap up I have a quotation by Gandhi when he was asked what do you think about the West and Western values and Western civilization <laughs> It seems to me it's an ideal full slot to wrap up this conference. Thank you very much.